a state law created to address racial discrimination in capital cases is under fire after just over two years in effect. We'll talk about the Life, Death, and the Racial Justice Act next on Black Issues Forum. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. In August of 2009, after much debate, the North Carolina State Legislature passed the Racial Justice Act, a law that would allow death row inmates to present evidence of racial bias in court. A recent Michigan State University study found a defendant in our state is almost three times more likely to be sentenced to death if at least one of the victims was white. But on November 14, 2011, the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys asked the state Senate to repeal the Racial Justice Act out of concern for cost and possibly clogging the system. They say 152 death row inmates have filed cases or claims under the Racial Justice Act. That's every inmate on death row except for five. The state NAACP is engaged in the fight to keep the law intact and says only one of those cases is actually moving forward. The intersection of racial and criminal justice is complex indeed, and today we'll talk to experts and concerned citizens on both sides. But first, here's some background on the subject from excerpts of a video commissioned by the North Carolina Coalition for a Moratorium and produced by By the Brook Films. Between December 2007 and May 2008, three wrongfully convicted men were exonerated from North Carolina's death row after spending a combined time of over 40 years waiting for their execution dates. All murder charges against Jonathan Hoffman, Edward Chapman, and Levon Jones were dismissed after findings that included prosecutorial misconduct, weak evidence, false testimony by witnesses, and perjury by investigators. But how did Edward end up sentenced to death for two murders? On New Year's Eve at the age of 25, he was arrested for the murder of Betty Jean Ramser, one of two women whose bodies had been discovered earlier that year in abandoned houses close to where he lived. Edward knew both victims but denied having anything to do with their murders. While in jail, he was also charged with the murder of Tanine Conley. So it's a frightening feeling because here it is, you're sitting there, you're telling these people, I did not do it, I did not do it. And the first thing you're saying, well, I've heard it before. I've heard it a thousand times. And I guess they look at your past and they were like, well, you know, you're not credible. You know, why should I believe you? Edward was tried for both women's murders later that year and was sentenced to death for each of them. In this country, there's some 20,000 homicides a year and yet fewer than uh, 1,000 or 1,500 receive death sentences. So the vast majority do not, and that's true in North Carolina as well. The U.S. General Accounting Office reports a pattern of evidence indicating racial disparities in charging, sentencing, and imposition of the death penalty. Are we being even-handed? Are we identifying the very worst among the worst and giving the death sentence to them alone? And what we find is that when we look at th that question, that those who've killed whites particularly seem to be overrepresented on death row, more of them given death sentences than in other cases. In North Carolina, the odds of getting the death penalty increase by three and a half times if you are a person convicted of killing a white person. In Edward's case and in the other two most recent North Carolina exonerated men's cases, at least one of the victims was white and one of their trials had an all-white jury. Racial bias, conscious or not, often affects jury decisions. North Carolina Representative Larry Womble and others have introduced new legislation aimed at reducing racial disparities in the state's capital punishment system. House Bill 472 and Senate Bill 461 known as the North Carolina Racial Justice Act, would allow a person accused of a capital crime to show if race played a part in the prosecutor's decision to seek the death penalty. 
The Racial Justice Act would allow a defendant to present statistical evidence or other evidence to help prove that race was a significant factor in seeking his death sentence. The burden is upon the defendant uh, to present that information and to prove that information and it's up to the judge whether the judge wants to accept that or not. The Racial Justice Act would never keep someone from being death sentenced on statistics alone, but it would turn to the state at a certain point and say, this looks likely enough now that you need to explain to the judge why it is this person is getting death when so many others similarly situated have not received that sentence. If a defendant succeeded in establishing his claim that race was a basis for his death sentence, the court could impose a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. And now I'd like to introduce today's guests. We have with us Ty Hunter, Executive Director of the Center for Death Penalty Litigation, a nonprofit private law firm dedicated to the representation of persons accused and convicted of capital crimes. Daryl Hunt, founder of the Daryl Hunt Project for Freedom and Justice and the Daryl Hunt Freedom Fighters. Gary Frank, District Attorney for Davidson and Davie Counties. And Marsha Howell, a woman whose teen daughter was murdered in 1992 by a current death row inmate who has filed a claim against the Racial Justice Act. Thanks everyone for being here. Sure, thank you. Marsha, I'd like to open with you. Would you share with us a little bit about the crime that was com committed against your daughter? Yes, um, in 1992, we were getting ready to go to work and it, there was a problem that night and my husband was looking for Chris because he had been stalking my daughter. And Chris is? is her ex-boyfriend. Chris and his cousin broke into my home that Monday morning, um, went to my, my husband's closet and stole the gun out of the closet and proceeded into my daughter's room. He shot her, which she was hollering and screaming, and her brother woke up. Now, her son was laying in the bed. Her brother woke up to help. The cousin was gonna take care of him at the time. But Chris, after he shot my daughter, went into the room and beat my, my son with the claw of a hammer. When he was questioned, he told exactly it was not the wooden part, not the blunt part, but the claw that he beat my son with. And then he shot him once in the head like he did my daughter. He was gonna shoot a second time, but the gun locked on him. He took the gun, placed it in the room, on the bed where the baby was, on the pillow beside his sippy cup. Went out, locked the door, and left that child in the house with his mother dead and his, his uncle fighting for his life. When the cousins got the call to go to my home, they had to bust in the door the same way went in and the baby was going from one room to the other. He had blood all over his clothes. They picked the baby up and the baby kept hollering for his mama. And she couldn't answer. My son was constantly fighting in a battle, even when they carried him out on a stretcher. Marcia, thank you for sharing your story and I'm so sorry for your loss. Can you tell us what your thoughts are on the Racial Justice Act? Yes. And I should mention to our audience that uh, the person who was convicted, tried twice yes. and convicted of this murder has filed a claim uh, against the Racial Justice Act. And the Racial Justice Act to me should be rewritten because I don't feel like it was written. When it was written, I feel like it was because blacks at that time was getting a harsher punishment than the white doing the same crime. I don't feel like the Racial Justice Act fits the whites, nor does it fit Chris Gregory. Because Chris Gregory, Gregory had a choice to make, and he chose to kill my daughter and tried to kill my son. And now he's able to get out, and my tax dollars are still paying for him on a death row and it's been 19 years.
Daryl, you have a very compelling story as well. Can you please share with our viewers a little bit about um, your story and why you established the foundation? Uh, um, in 1984, I was 19 years old. I was arrested and eventually tried and convicted and um, for the killing and uh, rape and murder of um, a white newspaper copy editor, Ms. Deborah Sykes. Um, I spent 19 years, four months, and 19 days in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Um, I was one vote away from the death penalty. And throughout that whole ordeal, um, one of the stories that has never been told is that before that, my mom, my mother was killed when I was nine. Uh, she was shot and, and killed. And um, so for me, um, part of establishing the project, the Dare Hunt Project, was all the accumulation of fighting for those who can fight for themselves, um, trying to help prove innocence, um, and bringing about our understanding about our criminal justice system. So we have, like, the Dare Hunt Project is three prongs to it. Uh, one is um, the fight for innocence. Um, the other is the, the reentry peace and the others to advocate for the change in, in making the laws better. Even more than 19 years later, it's clearly very difficult to talk about what you um, suffered as a result of injustice in the justice system and, and things aren't perfect. Um, so we appreciate the work that you're doing to help uh, represent uh, victims uh, of injustice on, on all sides. And so sorry for your loss as well. I'd like to go to you, Gary, and um, Ty, as we talk about the Racial Justice Act itself. Um, Gary, why did the Conference of District Attorneys believe that this act should be repealed? Well, it's, it's not, I know everyone's talking about it as a repeal. It is not actually a repeal. Um, the conference of district attorneys and and those a number of us uh, felt like this was a bad law when it was passed in 2009 i remember talking to my representative about it due to the way it's written not the objective but the the meat of it with regard to allowing statistical evidence uh, and allowing analysis from both the county the district the state to prove a systemic uh, effect in the justice system to impact on individual cases. Uh, the DAs believe that the facts and the law in each individual case is what should determine uh, the conviction and sentence. Ms. Uh, Howell's daughter's case is in my district. That's one of my cases, uh, one of the four cases under the Racial Justice Act. And the way the act is worded, um, it, it, the first paragraph in the amendment to it is the same in that no uh, prosecution shall be ba on the basis of race. What we want removed is the uh, statistical uh, element and the application of what went on outside of your individual case being able to impact a decision uh, in, the, in the individual case. Ty, let me ask you, um, I imagine that this argument has been heard by the supporters of the current uh, Racial Justice Act as it's worded. Is there any objection to um, what Gary has explained in terms of having each case heard on its own merits without bringing in statistical information relevant to a county, or to a state? Well, I think there's a false um a dichotomy between use of statistics and the merits of an individual case. You know, when we use statistics in uh, discrimination, in job discrimination cases, and have used it for uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years to decide whether a particular person has been discriminated against in uh, getting a job or not getting a job or being fired. And so what these statistics do is help inform the trier of fact, in this case the judge, as to whether there was discrimination in this particular case or not. Um, and so 
I think this idea that these statistics are unrelated to the behavior of the prosecutors is incorrect. The statistics are just a way of looking scientifically and objectively at, at hundreds and even thousands of different decisions that prosecutors have made. And so the state gets a chance to rebut these statistics. And so if there is an explanation for the statistics that says, well, this might look bad when you just look at the numbers, uh, but uh, we've got an explanation, they get to make that explanation. And, and I would say the supporters of the Racial Justice Act, uh, our position is simply, let's have a hearing Let's, we'll put on our evidence, let the state put on their evidence, and we'll show whether we can show discrimination in these cases or not. Well, uh, there has not even been a hearing. We've had, we've had the law for two years, and we have not yet had a hearing. Uh, there was a hearing scheduled for uh, uh, Fayetteville, actually, uh, last week, and the state asked for and received a continuance. And is this the case that's currently moving forward? And that's, this by is the, the only case, case that's mm -hmm. currently moving forward. Where Now, before we bring you back in, Gary, I wanted to ask uh, Ty, what are the criteria for filing a claim against the Racial Justice Act? Well, let me exp there are th really three bases for making a claim that race discrimination may have had an impact on your case. And one has to do with the race of the defendant. Did that have an impact on the case? The other has to do with the race of the victim. Did that have an impact on the case? And the third is uh, the race of jurors. In other words, was jury selection uh, uh, conducted in such a way that there was discrimination against, uh, uh, typically it would be African-American jurors in uh, having them put on these uh, uh, juries in capital cases. Now there's some specific statistics attached to each of these criteria in terms of the, uh, the disparities between uh, the way that jurors are selected, whether they're African American or white, uh, the, the race of the victim, um, and also the race of the defendant. Gary, did you want to respond? There is a case that's been moving forward. There's a group of them in Forsyth County and I think the hearings were actually held first, the preliminary hearings in those cases. Judge Wood has been presiding on those cases. They've had weeks and weeks of testimony on how to deal with the discovery issues relative to the statistics. So, um, and that's really the best indicator of the voluminous task this is gonna be. I think they've projected uh, next fall sometime before they get through with discovery on that case. And uh, the the aspect, there's been constitutional law on the books and a, and a body of law developed about any uh, prosecution that has a racially discriminatory purpose on all of these categories that Ty has talked about. And you mentioned the uh, selection of the jury, the grand jury makeup, jurors and everything. There's, there's protections to protect against a racially discriminatory purpose. The Racial Justice Act changes the law to say a significant factor which opens the door for all of these statistical analyses and it's difficult to uh, you have to come up with another academic study from the prosecution side to try one of these cases well, and the, the fact does remain that while about 20 percent of our population is african-american over 50 percent of the uh, inmate population is african-american and over 50 percent of the death penalty uh, uh, individual uh, inmates are African-American as well. So there's there's a disparity and that is the statistic that called into question the the fairness and the justice that's in, that's uh, existing in the justice system. But let, let me just, what we were worried about is the wide open aspect of this. In my two counties, there's four Racial Justice Act motions. One of them is a white male who killed a white two-year-old girl by savagely beating her head into the floor and uh, because she woke him up to go to the bathroom. Uh, he's had uh, two uh, jury trials, both times given the death sentence. One of them is Miss Howell's daughter's case where a black kills a, a black young black lady with her, her infant child. The other is a, a white defendant that broke into a white lady's house and cut her throat from ear to ear, then shot her in the head to make sure she couldn't identify him. The other one, the fourth one, is a racially mixed case where a black uh, defendant stabbed a 70-year-old 
uh, store owner, he had cashed a check for him the day before. That defendant had been previously convicted of a homicide, and it was his third or fourth violent assault. So the 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 door is wide open under the language of this. And I, you know, if while we're talking here, if a white defendant would crash through that door and put each one of us down and execute us, at his trial he could raise a racial justice uh, motion under the law as presently written. What I'd like to do is go back to you, Marsha and Daryl, and talk a little bit about justice, and the death penalty, and life in prison without parole. Marsha, do you think that well, the Racial Justice Act does allow an inmate to pursue their case, and if they win, my understanding is that rather than the death sentence, they would receive life in prison uh, without the chance of parole. Do you think that that is a just uh, sentence for the crime of murder? No, ma'am. I do not. Daryl, you spent time in prison for a crime that you did not commit. What, what are your thoughts on uh, life sentences versus death penalty? I, I, I think, you know, to have lived in there for 19 years, um, it's the worst place in the world that you ever want to live. Um, and there's no, even though I was innocent, being out now, I still have residual effects from prison. I mean, I still have the nightmares from prison. I still, there's no way that I could ever get that out of my head or out of my, my life. And um, I think to punish someone, and I can't speak for everybody, I can only speak for myself, to punish someone, to put them in prison, um, that they would have to relive this for the rest of their life. Um, is to me is the worst punishment that you can possibly give a person. And interestingly uh -huh. enough, there is an organization called uh, Families of uh, Murder Victims who are advocates of the racial justice system. Tell us a little bit about your work with them. Um, they are about restorative justice, uh, about um, helping families deal with um, the forgiveness and being able to forgive and it's hard to to forgive and I have to give a story uh, I'm not good at just talking so <laughs> but for me um, my mom was killed when I was nine years old and one of the things that I have to live with is learning to forgive and 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 I tried to forgive and um, I worked on that every day and it's and and one of the things, the lady who killed my mom um, actually stay three doors from me right now. And I see her every day. And it's, you know, for me, the whole time I was in prison, I, I, all I wanted was my mom. I wanted to be able to have somebody that I could talk to that could understand, that could fight for me, and I didn't have that. And now, every day that I walk out my house, I see the lady who actually killed my mom. And for me, I, give, I, I forgave her. Um, I, don't, I, I just try to picture what my mom would want me to do and how she would want me to act. And, and that, to me, is what sums up murder victims, families, organization about restorative justice, and I think our system uh, should be about that. As this, we have just a few I'm seconds sorry. left, Ty, I just want to ask you, as people are, th are thinking about the Racial Justice Act and what it's really intended to do, what would you want them to keep in mind? Um, I think we're ready to have a hearing in Fayetteville on jury discrimination, and there has been a, a history of jury discrimination in North Carolina ever since we've been a state. And it has been, you know, it's less uh, obvious now, but in all of these capital cases, including in the cases that Gary had in his county, there is, they are eliminating qualified black jurors at more than twice the rate as qualified white jurors. So these aren't jurors who aren't qualified 
to, for any reason not to be jurors. They're people who everyone agrees are legally qualified, and yet uh, black citizens are being removed from this, one of the most powerful positions a citizen can have to decide life or death for somebody. They're being removed from these juries all over the state and, and in Mr. Frank's district at more than twice the rate of white people. And we're saying that deserves a hearing. That deserves an explanation. I don't think they have an explanation, and that's why they're trying to repeal the law. There was a black juror, and when the trial was over, she came and she hugged us and she cried with us. Right. I, I, I know there so, was a black juror in your Yes. Case. And, and so what you're saying, I'm, I'm going to have to dispute what you're saying. I'm going against what you're saying. And when you stick with facts and you want to go with statistics and you want to go with, but you need to start, go back through and look at the facts because that's what Chris Gregory was found guilty and he got the death penalty because of the facts, we not have because of his race. Marsha, Daryl, Ty, Gary, thank all of you for your time again. This is a very serious and emotionally charged issue on all sides. Thanks to all of you for watching. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.